Welcome to One Hour Sale, a conversation with Steely Dan featuring songs from their new album, Everything Must Go, available as of June 10th, 2003. Everything Must Go is Steely Dan's ninth studio album, only their second studio album in the last quarter century, and their first since 2000's Two Against Nature, which earned them four Grammys, including one for Album of the Year. I'm Jody Denberg, and I am in Santa Monica with Walter Becker and Donald Fagan of Steely Dan. Gentlemen, I know you are East Coast natives, but Steely Dan formed here in L.A. Where do you make your homes now? Well, uh, I still live in New York. Um, we were out here from uh, 71 to 78 making the uh, Steely Dan albums that were on ABC Records. Came out here in 71 from New York and moved back in 78. Uh, well, I've, I've sort of split my time between uh, New York and uh, Hawaii at this point. And the record was recorded in New York, the new album. A little bit in Hawaii, but almost all in New York. Did your location affect the writing or recording of Everything Must Go? I don't think so. I think we have a uh, kind of a steely Dan room in our minds where, where these things are uh, conceived. The only thing that made this one uh, different maybe was that 9-11 uh, happened <clears throat> during the recording of this album. So much of Everything Must Go was recorded live to analog tape, which is, I guess, a different way of working for Steely Dan. Why did you go that route? Well, we uh, found ourselves working in a studio other than our usual studio, and it was a little uh, place that in called uh, Sear Sound that we... Uh, discovered after we got there had once been the hit factory where Donald and I had worked on an, uh, an album back in 1969 or 1970. Anyway, it was still sort of an old style studio, small control room, same tight acoustic uh, treatment in the playing room and uh, great little tracking room. And they didn't have any uh, digital machines. They had a lot of great old uh, vintage mics and uh, tube equipment and analog machines and we just started working on these analog machines and we loved the way it sounded. The new album is full of grooves. I mean there's these deep musical grooves on it. It seems like it would take forever to get them in the pocket when you're recording live. Well uh, actually we got lucky. We uh, started working with this drummer uh, that we discovered. Uh, he played on Two Against Nature on a, on a cut and his name is Keith Carlock. Everything we threw at him, he was able to uh, pick up on really quick. So by the end of the day or sooner, we'd, we'd have a track. I mean, he was just a great groove, groove drummer, and he's also uh, uh, unusual in that he's a great groove drummer. He's also a very good jazz drummer as well, so he's got both the jazz technique and uh, you know the happening backbeat. Who were some of the other uh, main musical menches who were involved on Everything Must Go? I like that main musical menches yeah. thing, you know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that myself later tonight at dinner or something. I think part of the reason we had uh, uh, as much uh, success getting, getting things happening was we had a whole rhythm section. We had a six-guy band, two guitar players, two keyboard players, uh, bass and drums, that uh, where everybody really... Uh, felt things the same way and was able to, uh, you know, get it, get on the same wavelength and really define uh, rhythmic parts and come up with uh, cool parts and all that. And so the other guys in the band, uh, Donald played keyboards, of course, uh, and I played bass. Uh, John Harrington played guitar. Hugh McCracken played guitar. Um, John, had, we'd played with before, we'd toured with and recorded with before, and of course Hugh we've been recording with since the 70s. Uh, and uh, Ted Baker uh, was the second keyboard player, great musician that we played with uh, on our last tour and on the last uh, album. So much of Everything Must Go seems to address the current state of affairs here in the U.S. of A. Was there a point after the last album when the two of you got together to brainstorm where you were going lyrically with Everything Must Go, or were these just the songs that poured out? As I recall, we did talk about certain kind of uh, thematic things that we were going to uh, write about before we started writing the songs, but they had nothing to do with the things that actually happened in the country. They were more sort of uh, uh, personal themes or motivations for the characters in the songs uh, or backstories for the characters of the songs. And I think that to some extent the uh, 
preoccupation, if there is one, with social order is just is is more a product of a sort of our growing fascination and horror at what we see around us and uh, what's happening in the world and so on. So many times the lyrics to Steely Dan songs are like puzzles that could have different solutions. Does it bug you when people ask you what the songs are about? Well, I, I think it's kind of uh, defeating for us to just give any explanation of the songs because I, I think uh, part of what makes them interesting is uh, associations that they spring in, in the listener's mind. But, uh, you know, we certainly have, have uh, something in mind when we write them that's, you know, maybe uh, specific. Um, although, you know, sometimes I'm not sure if, if we even... Uh, get down to the real details. You know, there, there are songs, we're not writing a novel or a film, so we don't have to know everything about a character, and we don't know, have to know everything about the situation the character's in, but we have a, a general idea. But uh, I think that the listeners, generally speaking, even if they get something else from the song than that we intended, it's usually pretty close, especially as to the feeling of it. Well, the song that opens the album is The Last Mall, and it seems like the beginning of the end. Are we sure the beginning of the end of what? Well, but it's a very swinging beginning of the end. It's a hard-grooving, hard-rocking beginning of the end, you know, and I think that, that, that matters as much as anything, don't you? If we're going to go, let's, let's go out rocking. That's Apoc- what I say. Apocalypse Wow. That was The Last Mall from Steely Dan's new album, Everything Must Go, and this is One Hour Sale a conversation with Steely Dan. The last mall ends really suddenly. That abrupt ending may be a case of the musical making a conceptual point? Well, yeah, actually it, it has a sort of standard ending that musicians would play at the end of a blues, uh, well, with some altered chords, but the last chord is absent. So uh, I guess that does reinforce the idea of uh, the apocalypse wow theme we were referring to earlier. Wow. The, <laughs> the yin and yang of the Dan, often happy music contrasted with bleak stories. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of Black Friday. I'm mm-hmm. thinking of Janie Runaway. But on this album, the dichotomy seems really apparent. Is it just that the new lyrics are really dark and the new music is really happy? <laughs> I don't think that the lyrics are necessarily... Uh, uh, darker than many others that we've written over time even in the more sort of subdued or hypnotic groove things on the album because of the way the band played them and because of the fact that they were you know real collaborations uh, of us with the band to make these things they have a uh, they have an energy and enthusiasm and uh, that they that they transmit which comes through it swings man yeah yeah we, we couldn't really get them to play a joyless even when we wanted them to you know yeah we tried to like all of our usual stuff to like you know grind them down to a consecrated nub but these guys were just you know in some cases too young and strong they're too tough tough for us yeah yeah they just outlasted us what can we say did winning four grammys including the grammy for album of the year for the last album two against nature affect your lives beyond having to answer this question um, not to any great extent. We it, it affected our life. We had to travel out to Los Angeles to go to the Grammys. We were household names for about three days uh, across the country. That's right. And uh, but then after that, everything pretty much settled into the uh, you know the usual grind. The the next song we're going to hear from Everything Must Go during this one hour sale is Things I Miss the Most. Could be the saga of a recent divorcee. Or the tale of, I was thinking uh, and hoping maybe some corporate corrupt executive who was stuck in jail. Am I warm? Oh, absolutely. I think all of those things are, are plausible. It's, you know, the uh, how low the mighty have fallen type of a, uh, type of a thing. That's true. Uh, I could have been a contender. From Steely Dan's new album, Everything Must Go, Things I Miss the Most... If you had to be separated from your prized possessions, what would be the things you'd miss the most, Walter? Well, I've got a guitar or two that I kind of like. I wasn't kidding about the 54 Strat, you know what I mean? And by the way, if anybody happens to have my 54 Strat out there, uh, I'd appreciate uh, returning it. That'd be a small reward, no questions asked. Donald, what would you miss the most? 
Uh, well, I think, you know, first of all, I'd, I'd grab my wife, cause, um, and she is portable. Uh, and then after that, um, I don't know, I guess, uh, see, the problem with the piano isn't portable, so maybe I'd take like a melodica or something, you know, some little keyboard instrument to could keep you, myself occupied. Could you carry one of my guitars if, if I mean, since you're not going to take the piano In the anyway, other hand, yeah, okay. Something like that. That's a deal. Maybe your wife could carry one too? Yeah. Okay. I'm guessing then one of the things you wouldn't rush to save is your Rock and Roll Hall of Fame award. <laughs> there was a hilarious and sarcastic campaign that you had to be elected into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame online. And then, lo and behold, Steely Dan was inducted. And then I saw you auctioning off at least one of your awards. What were some of the better bids that you had on the awards? I think my favorite bid was uh, the uh, our, our keyboard player, Ted Baker, offered to trade it for his Bunsen Prize plaque that we gave him at a concert uh. Uh, in the year 2000. Uh, and uh, I thought about that one pretty seriously, and then I turned him down. Donald, I believe, left his Hall of Fame statuette uh, in the hall overnight uh, on the very night that it was given to him. That's true. That the, 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 on the day after, I was knocking my door, and it was a neighbor who uh, I, I had, uh, you know, uh, left my uh, Hall of Fame plaque out in the hall by mistake. I guess I had a few things I was carrying, and uh, but uh, he returned it to me. Yeah, that's a real honor code building over there that uh, Donald's in. So the awards do both reside with both of you still. They did not receive winning bids, is what I'm No, mean. they did, did not. We have them in New York. We had some very generous offers, but uh, in the end, you got to, like, package thing. you got to get the money order from the guy, or, you know, the girl has to fly into town. You've, she's got to see a doctor. It just was too much trouble. But, you know, I think the fans like to see us get awards, you know, because it ratifies their, their taste over a long period of years. So uh, there, there was something nice about getting these awards. I mean, for us too, and, and no kidding. That, that's right. The, you know, the main reason for even accepting or considering accepting any awards like this for us, aside from the shallow you know, uh, gratification that it affords us and whatever money we can squeeze out of the thing one way or the other, is for the greater glory of our fans, which is always on our minds. Are there songs on the new album that were germs of songs that were never completed before, or are all of these posts too against nature? Germs is a good word. Yeah, we have a lot of songs that uh, you know have a kind of a uh, bacterial, bacterial uh, or infectious quality uh, to them that, uh, in all of the worst possible mm -hmm. senses. But I'm I'm thinking it that. These were all songs that we wrote after uh, Two Against Nature. We had some songs left over, and uh, we even tracked uh, at least one of them and got a good track, but for one reason or another, we picked this particular set, and they were all new ones. There's a phrase I've heard used for someone who's unemployed. They say that person is on the beach. And the song Blues Beach on Everything Must Go speaks of the early resigned during the 20 years that Donald Fagan and Walter Becker didn't record together as Steely Dan, did either of you think that your band was eternally kaput? Well, our band, I guess, actually was on the beach, as you say, uh, uh, as of about 1974, a steady band. And after that, we started using a group of players, uh, both in New York and Los Angeles, that um, uh, we tried to, to, to adapt to their various styles. But I don't think we were on the beach, really. Well, Walter was literally on the beach for part of that in Hawaii. Everything Must Go is the new album from Steely Dan, and we're having a one-hour sale, a conversation with Steely Dan. That song was Blues Beach. First, what in the world is a paranymphic glider? See, this is why we don't like to give the reviewers uh, printed copies of the lyrics, because that might have just slid by, although now that I think about it, uh, even uh, people who've listened have asked that question. Paranymphic Glider is a, an imaginary um, uh, vehicle that you would take an imaginary girl on an imaginary date A with. particularly hot date. A, a very hot imaginary date. Are they for sale on your website? or uh, we, no, have but pro we have a prototype, but they'll be available soon. There was a, a time when Steely Dan, like some of the characters in the song we just heard, Blues Beach, was early resigned. And then there were a series of events that ultimately led to Steely Dan rearing its head again. Donald, you played some Steely tunes on the New York Rock and Soul Review. 
And Walter, you produced Comic Curiad, Donald's solo album. That's right. Then you joined the New York Rock and Soul Review on the Road. That's right. And then, uh, Donald, you produced Walter's solo album, 11 Tracks of Whack. Correct. Well, co produced, yeah. So, surprisingly enough, when the name Steely Dan was used again, it was for a concert tour and not for an album for the first time in 94. And you guys hadn't played on the road for 20 years. How did it happen that when Steely Dan resumed, it was on the road? No one would have predicted that, I don't think. But uh, as it happened, uh, Donald had finished the Comic Curiad album. He had done the Rock and Soul uh, review for a couple years, and I had done a few. And we uh, wanted to promote uh, his record. And also, we had seen the reception and the enthusiasm that was there for us to do Steely Dan songs. And so we just put two and two together. Plus, we had a manager at that time uh, that... Uh, felt that he could show us uh, if we if we did a little touring that it was not going to be the uh, incredible uh, series of uh, snafus and screw ups that our tours were in the uh, in the 70s so uh, he was right and out we went when you started playing concerts and there were tours in 1994 95 96 did you approach them with more of an improvisational slant or were you just trying to reproduce the records faithfully I, I don't think we were ever uh, interested in really reproducing recordings I think um, although on the other hand I think uh, uh, when we listened to the old records we noticed that some of the arrangements were actually quite good and quite complete and worked well on stage um, uh, things that we, we uh, could expand for the stage or things that uh, uh, things that were hits that were kind of boring to play after a while we we try to change the arrangement once in a while try to kick them up a little bit and uh, maybe um, if we have a soloist who uh, we uh, who's working with us who who uh, we think might fit in really good on a certain song we can expand the arrangement to include uh, some uh, improvisation etc how is your music appreciated differently in, say, Japan, where there's a language barrier? Of course, we don't really know uh, exactly uh, what um, they make of the parts that don't make sense to them. But we know that uh, that uh, they're uh, they're big fans and that they they like the music and that they get the uh, you know they're very attentive to the songs. There are probably things in our songs that don't translate that well. Um, but we've had that same problem with even with English-speaking people now that yeah. I think about it. So. <laughs> there were so many years when Steely Dan was an insular institution, and now there's concert tours, and the internet gives you more exchange with your audience. Who are these people listening to Steely Dan? That's a good question. Who are these people? These are the people who made this country great. <laughs> they are good, good. The sons and daughters of the pioneers. pioneers you know. <laughs> we don't know, uh, you know, uh, we uh, see people uh, at, at shows and we meet uh, people from at shows or on the street or something like that. And uh, in generally speaking, a very likable uh, affable bunch of people. Obviously, they have excellent taste in music. Uh, yeah, I think we actually have the most in, uh, intelligent fans. Um, you know, possibly, uh, possibly in the area of psychosis, we're probably also equal with with some other bands who are known for that. But uh, but you know what? I've I've found that the the real hardcore psychotics are are not faithful to one band or another. They, oh, they switch, switch around off. depending on who you know happens to pop up on their radar screen. Folks are listening to your songs, and there are various interpretations, as we mentioned earlier. Do you have any favorite misinterpretations that were so far off you, you could share them without shattering anyone's illusions? Well, I remember once, and uh, this is actually concerning a song that was on uh, my solo album, The Nightfly. Uh, it's called IGY, and the chorus was, What a beautiful world this will be. What a glorious time to be free. And a uh, uh, I had calls from several corporations who wanted to use the uh, song in their commercials. I guess what they, they didn't realize was that um, the chorus was, was meant to be, you know, ironic and was actually sort of stating the opposite of what it seemed to be saying. So that was one thing I can recall. Can you remember any favorite misinterpretations? Um, 
You must seem to remember that uh, somebody thought that the uh, the line, the sparkle of your China, in uh, in Bodhisattva actually said something like, the spark of your vagina. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a song we're about to hear called God Whacker that people will interpret in various ways, but it seems to be obviously about terrorism and the post-911 bring him back dead or alive mentality, the start of the end of history, but there's a lot of different ways we can go with this song. Since Steely Dan has been known to wax satirical a time or two, have you ever pondered the role of satire in society, especially during uh, times like now? Uh, well, yeah, it, it seems like, you know, uh, what we're going through now tends to, uh, you know, as, as if there was some kind of standing gag order in place that you couldn't be funny or uh, sarcastic, you know, and you know, we're trying to ignore that, but it's it's it, it's it is difficult. It's actually when that's when when they say standing gag order, they mean that there has to be an ongoing series of gags. Yeah, that's, that's the what way they're we're, trying we're, to tell so us. You know? it, you that's know? how we look at it. Yeah. Unfortunately, a lot of what's going on now is beyond satire. It's already really in the realm of satire as it's unfolding, you know. Uh, and uh, can't really be satirized because it's already so ridiculous. We're having a one-hour sale with Steely Dan and Everything Must Go. That's the title of their brand new album. The last few years have brought a lot of new technologies to sound reproduction 5.1, super audio CDs, improved sampling rates. Are either of you attuned to technical innovations either when you're recording a new or in relation to your back catalog? I think we're aware of two kinds of technical innovations. There's the kind number one, category number one would be uh, things that can help us to do something that we wanted to do musically or sonically that we couldn't do before uh, and that we probably wanted to do for 20 years. And the category number two are things that can actually um, increase our income. So every time somebody comes up with some new format in which uh, our material can be repackaged, we put aside whatever forebodings we may have about the uh, durability or uh, advisability of that particular format and throw our weight behind it 110% and get the product out there on the shelves and see if anybody will buy it. Now, the one exception to that would be the album, the Asia album, because the, one of the reels of master tape from the Asia album is, uh, I'm not going to say that it's lost or missing, but I have a feeling that wherever my 54 Strat is, that's where that reel of tape may be. So uh, we can't really do any 5.1s or haven't figured out yet a way to do a 5.1 or a DVDA or anything else of the Asia album. But stay posted. Yeah, if anyone knows where our multi-track tape is, hand it over. Yeah, we're, we have a $600 reward out on that baby. I think it's up to $600 now, so. No questions asked. Right. You mentioned the 54 Strat. Walter, what are your favorite guitars these days? Mostly I use one particular uh, Strat-type guitar that uh, was built by Roger Sadowski. That's a very nice, playable instrument. Sounds great. And Donald, what are your favorite keyboards in as importantly, how do you decide which one to use for which song? Well, uh, let's see. As far as pianos, I'll just play whatever piano's in the room, and uh, pretty much. My other two main instruments are, are you know, an old Fender Rhodes piano, uh, Rhodes 88, <clears throat> and uh, a Wurlitzer uh, electric piano. Some parts lend themselves to, to one electric piano or the other, and you can tell that by just trying it out and seeing how the action responds and so on. But generally speaking, I, I don't uh, very rarely use synthesizers because they're not tunable in the way that uh, uh, pianos or old-fashioned electric pianos are, are tunable, which is to say you actually have a piano tuner come in and tune them by ear because um, synthesizers always sound a little out of tune to me no matter what. Speaking of muso type stuff, mm -hmm. I think it was May 2001, you both received honorary doctorate degrees from the Berklee School of Music mm -hmm. and attended the students' tribute concert that featured your music. What was that experience like? Did you like their interpretations? 
Well, the really astounding thing was the next day when we shook the hands of everybody in the uh, graduating class, uh, and I've never, oh, I've never shook. Had to be about six hundred handshakes. Yeah, and uh, that's a hell of a thing, right there. You know, your hand is sore for days after that. Yeah. So it really made an impression on you both. Oh yeah. Well, I you know destroyed my career. I can no longer play the piano, but uh, you know. Well, I'll take another tack then to asking you about other people's interpretations of your songs because there was the film Me, Myself, and Irene. Ah, and I see the, what you're getting at. Yeah, the soundtrack had everyone from Leon Redbone to Wilco. Uh, did any of the covers stand out to you as exceptional or at least as interesting? Yeah, I thought the best one was the one by the group Ivy, a uh, version of uh, a song called Only a Fool Would Say That. That was, yeah, that that was, was my good. favorite. And that all, was my favorite too. Yeah, all the rest of them were, were good too. It was all it was all good, in other words. One thing that's always good and that thankfully always remains in this world and on your albums, the topic of women and sex. And to my ears, there's a series of tunes about those topics on Everything Must Go. And one may mark the start of the end of history. It features Walter Becker's first lead vocal on a Steely Dan studio album, the <laughs> song Slang of Ages. Thank you very much, You're Jody. Welcome. Why did you choose to sing this song, Walter, from the dozens and dozens that you and Donald have co-written? Uh, because this song had sort of a talking verse, and so uh, it was uh, easier, far easier than any of the others that have been available to me heretofore. Yo, yo, Jay-Z, look out. Musical history being made, that slinky, steely dance song, Slang of Ages, from the new CD, Everything Must Go. It's the first to feature lead vocals by Walter Becker. Teamed with your songwriting, production, and multi-instrumentalist skills, I'm thinking, Walter, you grew up in a musical environment. Is that true? Uh, well, no, actually. I grew up in the, in the suburbs of New York City in the 50s, and uh, so there was the music of the day around on the radio and the car radio and so on but it was nobody played in the house and there were no instruments my father had been uh, uh, made to play the violin when it, when he was a kid and he was still sort of bitter about that as far as i could tell he did have a uh, a copy of uh, the harvard dictionary of music which i i've found later that i had colored when i was a little kid that was about as far as it went though so after that it was just what was in the air you right, know? didn't your father have a copy of the dialogue of the Carmelites, you got that when I was like twelve or something like that. Uh, uh, he had he had like three or four records, and that was oh, uh, one of them. A very strange uh, collection. It was the uh, dialogue of the Carmelites, uh, an opera by Poulenc, which featured his favorite part was the um, guillotining of the nuns at the end, where they sing a little dirge. And it's my favorite part. You too. hear this whack of the blade, yeah. and there's one less voice in the singing the dirge, and then another whack of the blade, and down to the last nun. And what about you growing up? Music in the house. Uh, yeah, well, my mother was a singer when she was a kid, uh, well, from about age uh, 5 to 15 or something like that. Uh, she used to sing up in the Catskills <coughs> at hotels and so on, sort of the uh, Shirley Temple of the uh, Catskills or whatever, of the Borscht Belt. And um, so she used to sing around the house. She knew uh, quite a bit about swing music and generally speaking, the women in my family, as with many sort of depression era Jewish families, uh, the women could all play the piano a little bit, you know, so uh, I just picked it up. For many of us, Steely Dan turned us on to classic jazz, the way British invasion rockers paved our path to first-generation blues. I know you still love your roots and influences, but these days, if, let's say, you were reading a magazine and you read an article about a critically acclaimed contemporary musician, would you seek it out? Would you go, wow, this Wilco review seems interesting, or this Beck guy? Yeah, I, I actually did buy the Wilco album. And I bought a couple of Beck albums, and uh, so occasionally, not not as often maybe as uh, you might think, but uh, once in a while. Yeah, I'll buy something occasionally. I've I've uh, got a Beck album somewhere. You know, I like TLC when they were uh, when they were hot. I still mainly listen to my uh, these old jazz records. <clears throat> pretty much when they get you know they've been reissued on CD and they sound really good and. 
That's sort of still the staple of my, uh, you know, record collection. I maybe should have asked you this before when we were talking about covers. Have you ever written a song you had hoped would be covered by a particular artist? Well, when we first uh, moved to California, it's because we had uh, gotten these jobs as staff writers at ABC Dunhill Records. Our job was to write songs for the uh, house artists. So in those days, we, we were trying to get songs done by uh, other artists. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get very many done, and we, we realized very quickly we couldn't really write pop songs very well. That's when we took out our other book with the other songs in it and, and got a few musicians together and formed a band. Hey 19 by Al Green. Could have been. I don't see why not. Mm -hmm. It's still a good idea. What are some of the most unlikely places you've heard your music? Yeah, it was pretty weird. Like uh, in, I was in this mall in Japan when we were playing and heard, actually heard Hey 19 and an instrumental version, what sounded like a Japanese choir of schoolgirls singing, you know, humming the melody. And that was pretty exciting. You know, I don't know if I believe that uh, story or if that was just something that you dreamed. I don't. No, that's a true story. We got to get a copy of that. That's. I know. I. I mean, I was. You know, I was. I was just so astounded. You know. So you can never trace something like that down. That's the thing. You know, we yeah. hear great music versions, or, and we never get to hear them. As we are coming close to the end of this one-hour sale, a conversation with Steely Dan about their new album, Everything Must Go. The modern age does demand a few modern questions. One of the new songs, Pixeline, besides having a keen falsetto part, seems to be about digital delights and deceptions. Steely Dan has had its own website for about seven years. I'm wondering if one of you is more internet interested than the other? That would be Walter Becker. Well, I was living in Hawaii when uh, the internet, when I became aware of the existence of something called, something called the internet. and. Uh, so it afforded me a uh, opportunity to be in uh, communication with the uh, the culture at large that was pretty uh, new and unique. That's how I slipped into it. Our engineer Roger Nichols uh, was always uh, deep into computers, uh, going way back into the '70s, and uh, so I think we both uh, we both knew a little bit about computers, uh, especially in in regard to uh, you know, programs having to do with music and percussion programs going going back a ways. Everything Must Go ends with the title track, Donald, and as you arrange the horns, you may be the one who can reveal what spurred the unusual tenor sax fanfare introduction of the title song. Right, well, uh, yeah, actually that wasn't really arranged. We uh, originally had a piano introduction planned for Everything Must Go, and then, uh, which is actually the melody and chords of the bridge, which is stated later, but um, we had done uh, this one track with uh, this tenor player, Walt uh, Weisskopf, and uh, he had this kind of cosmic sound that uh, we associate with the uh, 60s free jazz, and we realized it would be uh, a good way to start that tune by having him state the melody, because it's sort of this incredibly grandiose uh, introduction, you know, that get your expectations up for a, a song about a bunch of losers. Well, with the song and album, Everything Must Go, should we be worried about the end of Steely Dan, the end of the world, both? I wouldn't worry, I think. No use worrying about it, really. Really, uh, we just feel that from the ruin of the old will grow the new. Rise like a phoenix. Yeah. No, cause, uh, there's We're always, celebrating that part of see, the process. Even if the worst happens, remember, there's always mutation. You've been listening to One Hour Sale, a conversation with Steely Dan about their new album, Everything Must Go. Thanks to Phil Costello, Alex Caronfly, Rochelle Staub, Marina Van Wormer, and everyone at Reprise Records. And a special thank you to Walter Becker and Donald Fagan. One Hour Sale was engineered by Scott Levitton. I'm your host, Jody Denberg. That's it. Everything must go.